University, where she's been at uh, since 2019. Uh, Anna, uh, we we invited her to Sherbrooke uh, just before the pandemic, so everything uh, everything f fell, fell apart uh, in that week. But um, but we are very happy that at least she she's able to uh, to join us virtually. Um, Anna's uh, research topic is at the intersection of uh, quantum optics, atomic physics, uh, open quantum systems, and uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, she likes to work on fundamental physics, but she's also interested in uh, exploiting those phenomena to develop uh, novel applications in quantum sensing, quantum information science, and uh, metrology. So it's actually a, a very fitting speaker for an audience like RQMP. Uh, Anna obtained her PhD in 2014 uh, from uh, Madrid. And then uh, between 2015 and 2018, uh, she was a, a Marie Curie fellow at uh, I guess two places simultaneously. <laughs> I think there's so like a global fellowship, so it's uh, you are in superposition. Okay, so she was at the superposition of uh, between uh, Barcelona, uh, working with Derek Chang at the Institute of Photonic Sciences, and also at Caltech, uh, working with uh, Jeff Kimball at the Institute of Quantum Information and Quantum Matter. So, uh, and as I mentioned, she's yes. now uh, at Columbia as a professor. So. Uh, uh, with that, I will, I will leave the floor to, uh, to Anna, but uh, maybe before uh, doing so, let me just mention that you are free to ask questions uh, during the talk. Uh, you can either uh, raise your hand or, uh, and I can, I can uh, get, uh, maybe uh, ask, uh, ask you to speak or otherwise you can uh, ask your question on the chat and uh, I'll be happy to, to pass it on to, to Anna. Is it okay if we interrupt you during the talk? Yes, I mean, it's not just okay. I really encourage it because okay. it's, I get bored of myself. So I really, please okay. ask questions. <laughs> okay, very good. So uh, so thank you and welcome, uh, Anna. Okay, uh, let me see if I can share my screen, which I think you should be seeing my screen. And if I move my mouse, you see my mouse as well, right? Yes. Uh, okay, great. So thank you so much, Jan, for, uh, you know, inviting me to present our work uh, and I'm very excited to share it with all of you. So again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, what I'm going to talk about is um, the physics, uh, the single few um, uh, many body levels uh, of, um, uh, that you can find in atomic chains. And so it's uh, about optics, but it includes like uh, also many body physics. So not just linear optics. This is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I'm going to start by asking a question that is, you know, in quantum physics, we care about how can we control quantum systems and prevent the coherence. And in quantum optics, this question has another, uh, you know, form that is how can we realize control atom photon interactions? And so this is important, not just from the perspective of fundamental science, but also if we want to uh, realize applications such as, you know, single photon sources or uh, applications of metrology, uh, quantum networks and in general quantum information processing. So I wanted to start by uh, discussing, well, I think I went backwards. Okay. So I'd like to start by discussing what is different in, you know, a uh, optical system from a condensed matter system. So I wanted to discuss what are the, the fundamental differences when we have, for instance, a wire and we apply a voltage and there is an electron flow. What happens if instead of of this system, we have a different system that is a fiber where we pump this fiber with a laser at a given frequency and now photon propagates through the fiber. So things, uh, you know, in the picture, they look similar, but the physics is actually somewhat different. So first, everything happens in the optics at a given finite frequency. And a very important thing is that if we have a defect in the fiber, for instance, as the photon encounters this defect, it can jump outside the fiber. We're going to lose it. And so thinking about uh, that in an electronic system will be crazy. You don't have a density of states for electrons to jump into free space. So then um, this is the first difference between an electronic and an optical system is that a photonic system are, is inherently open. So there is certain conflict between wanting to control the system uh, through you know, pumping and the dissipation. There is uh, another uh, difference that is again also related somewhat with you know, conservation of, of charge or the presence of charge in a system, in a condensed matter system, is that 
photons do not interact with each other. So if we have a solid state system, um, electrons are going to see each other and they are going to interact through some type of potential. However, to make photons interact, we need to interface them with matter. So matter is in the form of atoms or emitters and so on. So now imagine that we want to build a light matter interface where we can control dissipation at the same time uh, we can realize a strong light matter interactions, which are, or photon photon interactions, which are important for quantum information processing. The idea light matter interface would be strongly nonlinear, and at the same time, we would be able to control the dissipation. So then let's try to come up with potential examples and see why they fail or how they fail. So the first one is to have a single atom. So a single atom is, uh, you know, uh, in my mind, as a math theorist, it has just two, uh, two levels. So it has a ground state and excited state. When a photon comes, it's absorbed, it promotes the atom to the excited state. And if a second um, photon comes, then the response of this atom is going to be very different. So it's a, you know, this single atom is a strongly nonlinear system, but it decays because once the atom is in the excited state, it's, uh, it sees basically all the optical modes and it can decay into them. And this is associated with the excited state having a lifetime. And the inverse of the lifetime is uh, the spontaneous emission rate into vacuum. And when the atom decays, it emits uh, very broadly. And so we cannot really control the radiation very much. It goes into all directions, more or less. So now this is related with the second problem that uh, we have. If we want to make uh, an atom and a photon interact uh, efficiently, this is difficult in free space. And it's related with this idea of um, um, broad emission. So if we just send a laser field into uh, an atom, the probability of interaction is given by the absorption cross-section of the atom that scales as lambda squared, where lambda is the wavelength of the photon divided by the mode area. And so because of the diffraction limit, one cannot arbitrarily confine an optical field. And this probability of interaction is very small. So okay, a single atom is not the best uh, type of, a single atom in free space is not the greatest light matter interface. So what can we do to solve this? Uh, the first thing that uh, Purcell told us you know, many decades ago is that the decay rate of an atom depends on its environment. So we can change it. And so I have said that when we have an atom in, in a given environment that is vacuum, uh, when it is excited, it has a certain probability of a rate of decay that is the spontaneous emission rate. And this is related with the imaginary part of the Green's function, the local part of the Green's function. So the Green's function is just the propagator of the electromagnetic field in some environment. And so it's given by you know, the boundary conditions of the electric environment. Uh, and so what we can do is we can change the environment. So we could place a mirror next to the atom. This is going to modify this propagator. And uh, this is going to modify, therefore, the spontaneous emission rate. So boundaries and environment is what determines the lifetime of an atom, basically, and of an excitation. So people have uh, thought about doing this, uh, not just putting an atom, a mirror, but putting two. And this is basically the idea between, behind cavity QED. So in that case, uh, you can achieve very controlled interaction between an atom and a photon that is confined in the cavity. And so how well or how efficient is this interaction is given by a figure of Merin that is the probability of decay into the cavity mode versus the probability of losing the photon into free space. And you can be a bit more creative than this. And people have now explored a lot the concept of uh, waveguide QED. So this is uh, conceptually very similar in reality. You just place an atom close to a 1D um, photon bus, and when the photon that propagates into the, through this waveguide interacts with this atom, it's going to interact efficiently if the rate of decay into the waveguide, gamma 1D, is much larger than the decay of uh, the probability of emitting the photon into free space or the decay of the atom into free space. So, okay, so it looks like through engineering, if you want, of the uh, optical environment, one can realize more control light matter interactions. And it's not just a matter of quantitatively better, but actually waveguide QED um, enables many different paradigms that are not possible in free space. So for instance, if you take a dielectric and you pattern it with certain modulation, this produces an optical band gap. In, uh, the band, in the band gap, this is a region that of frequencies, basically, where photons are not allowed to propagate. 
And this produces um, different type of interactions between the atoms that are not possible to realize in, in free space. On top of this, we can think of atoms as perfect mirrors. So now we have really a truly one dimensional channels where photons propagate. And so if a photon impinges on an atom and this uh, rate of coupling is large, then a single atom can reflect all the, you know, all the photon basically on resonance. So the, the transmittance can decrease to zero and the reflectance becomes one. And this is a process of interference, but it can happen in 1D. Another option is uh, that has been recently explored is that of chiral quantum optics. So basically any type of near field has helicity, which means that the field is not uh, like the field in far field where we have a transverse field. There is a longitudinal component in the polarization of the, of the near field. This means that if we address, we place an emitter with the right polarization, it's going to link this uh, kind of spin degree of, of freedom or polarization with the propagation direction. So an emitter with a sigma minus type of transition is going to emit in one direction and the emitter with the, uh, with the other polarization, the, the other circular polarization will emit into the right. So it's not just better, but it's different. And so I wanted to convince you of, you know, people have been exploring these regimes of interfacing atoms. And when I say atom, you have to think of, you know, very generally atom is basically a quantum emitter. You can think of this as, you know, uh, uh, solid state emitters like color centers in diamond, or you can think of superconducting qubits coupled to transmission lines. So the physics is very similar. And so I have convinced you that I've tried to convince you that people um, have been working on this for many years of interfacing atoms with dielectrics or with 1D channels to tailor the density of modes and how photons propagate in these channels just to, uh, you know, create other types of paradigms, optical paradigms. And the question that I wanted to ask now is, can we just do this without dielectrics, just with atoms themselves? And the answer is that actually this is possible. And this is possible because um, if you place atoms in an ordered manner in an array, these atoms support, this array support guided modes. So these guided modes are actually dark modes. They are modes that uh, don't decay into free space. So now you're going to have a spin excitations or photons that propagate along this 1D channel in form of a spin excitations that as they propagate, it's like if they don't see free space, they, there is no type of dissipation. They just continue as this would be a waveguide, even though it's not, and it's just a bunch of atoms in free space. And so this is, uh, you know, the magic of this is just pure interference. Like this is actually a classical phenomenon of subradiance. Uh, and you can use this idea of uh, having dark states to build better memories or atomic clocks, because basically once you store a photon, using these dark excitations, it, it will live forever. But this is not what I'm going to talk about today. So I wanted to just, so this is, this is why I think, uh, I mean, from a theoretical perspective, I think this is interesting because it's new physics, but uh, this is motivated by experiments. And I wanted to show you recent results realized, um, you know, in the last five years where people have place atoms in very well ordered uh, arrays where they are, you know, with high field infraction. So what you're seeing here is a 1D array of atoms. So this is a picture of the array. Uh, so you're seeing fluorescence from the atoms. Each of these dots is a single atom. Uh, people have done this in 1D in, so this is an experiment in Harvard. Um, they have done it in 2D. So this is an experiment in the uh, group of Antoine Brouet in Paris. So they can generate very different types of geometries and they can even do it in 3D. So this is the Eiffel Tower. So it's a group in Paris. They thought this was a very good <laughs> idea to do. So basically uh, my claim is that if you place these atoms close enough, they are going to start interact uh, with each other optically and they can then behave themselves as dielectric structures for other emitters. So this is already uh, proven experimentally. So in this has happened in this year. So in 2020, there have been two experiments that are I wanted to, to mention. The first one is um, was performed in Munich. And the idea is that you have a 2D 
lattice of uh, atoms. So this is atoms trapped in an optical lattice. And you come with a field that propagates normally to the array. And this field gets reflected almost, I mean, not perfectly, it's like 60% reflectance. And this is because there is um, complete destructive interference in the forward direction and almost perfect if you want, except for experimental imperfections. Uh, uh, very good reflection in, um, in the backward direction. And this is just because there is interference because atoms are placed, this, this lattice constant is smaller than the wavelength of the light that comes. So it's a cooperative phenomenon. Uh, and another recent experiment um, was performed in Paris. So in this experiment, it's maybe not as uh, shocking. It's just that they place atoms close to each other in a 1D lattice. So you cannot see it here, but basically these are a bunch of atoms uh, placed uh, regularly spaced with uh, optical tweezers. And they have cell light and they see uh, that the light that uh, is emitted is shifted in frequency. So this is another example of um, you know, cooperativity. Okay, so given that this is already something that is happening experimentally, the question is, you know, let's try to use these uh, ideas to do something useful. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is, uh, is basically two things. So I'm going to tell you about how to do atomic waveguide QED, where you have instead of a waveguide, an array of atoms, a 1D array. And I'm going to talk about single and few photon physics in this system. And the second thing that I want to tell you about is what happens when instead of being in this kind of few photon uh, regime, you start placing a lot of photons, start exciting really your chain and placing a lot of excitations. In that case, the idea of waveguide completely explodes. This is completely different paradigm. And what you have to think about is the process called Dicky super radiance. So I will address this in the second part of my talk. Okay, so this is the introduction. So if you have any question, you can ask me now, or if not, I will start discussing the physics. Okay. Okay, so I just wanted very briefly to say how we deal with this. So we have, a, in general, you have a bunch of atoms and you have free space and it's, a, you know, it's an annoying problem to have because you have a Hilbert space that scales as two to the end for n atoms and then you have all the continuum, you know, like infinite modes associated with the electromagnetic field. So how do you deal with that? The idea um, that we follow is to basically integrate out the photonic degrees of freedom and you end up with a spin model for the atoms. And it's a spin model that is a bit different from traditional spin model systems because now you have to think of we are taking the atoms and these are the system and the continuum of most electromagnetic fields, this is the bath. So now we have an open quantum system, okay? So then our density matrix that is only accounts for atomic degrees of freedom evolves according to a Hamiltonian, but also according to a Lindblad operator that accounts for the dissipation. So the Hamiltonian is just simple. Uh, it just, this part is simple. It just tells us that the atoms have a given resonance frequency omega zero. And this part here, uh, this is uh, basically an XY model, but it's potentially long range XY model. So you have a coupling here, J, that is proportional to the real part of the Green's function. So the Green's function, again, is the propagator of the electromagnetic field. And because we have integrated these degrees of freedom, it, uh, it appears here as a coupling. Uh, and it tells us that uh, there are processes where atom J and atom I, one goes from the excited to the ground state, and the other goes from the ground to the excited state. Okay, So it's like a spin flip type of interaction. And then we have the Lindblad operator, which is written in a more complicated form, but the, these gamma coefficients are related with the imaginary part of the propagator of the Green's function. And the important thing is that this is not diagonal in atom index. We are keeping uh, the different atom indexes because we're going to talk about collective processes, okay? Fine, so now let's take that formalism and use it to understand the physics of one yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah, uh, could you just repeat, so uh, the physical situation, uh, uh, I guess you're going to maybe, the slides like, it looks like you might talk about it here. So distance between atoms and the, particularly the wavelength of light is, um, what is the, that relationship and uh, to, to get the, you know, this X, Y term to be appreciable? Yes. Uh, yeah, so in principle, this is general, so it doesn't, like the distance and so on, it doesn't matter, but in reality, uh, so the quantization formalism is generic. 
but in reality what you need to have dark states or bright states uh, physics that is interesting uh, it depends on the type of uh, bath you're in so for instance if you are in a wet type the interaction is infinite range so in a 1d uh, waveguide the field doesn't decay right so the propagator is e to the ijx so in that sense it doesn't matter what is the distance there might be either the j term or the gamma terms m m gamma term might be dominant but it doesn't matter the distance because the field propagates like uh, you know without decay in free space in particular in 3d uh, the decay is a power law or a sum of power laws so interesting physics are going to happen whenever the distance is of the order of the wavelength Yes. And then there is another part of this problem that is that you want to be somewhat close to resonance of the atom. So if you send, you know, you could send a field that is completely out of resonance and then, you know, uh, these are all if you want to think in the single excitation linear dipole. So you may like yeah, drive them a little bit, but if you're very far away from resonance, the light barely sees the atom. So that's the other, if you want the other quantity in the system, that is the lambda zero, the wavelength associated with the transition that you care about. So we're always going to talk about wavelengths, light wavelengths that are similar to the wavelength of the transition. Yes, yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, here, I have another question. Um, maybe you were explaining it now, but in the previous slide, yes. you mentioned that there's, um, the uh, decay rate depends on the matching part of the Green's function. Uh, right. What does that imaginary part come from? I mean, there's a, there's a dissipation? Like yes, a... okay, yes, of course. So in the, initially how you deal with this is you have a Hamiltonian that uh, you consider that atoms are dipole. So you have a Hamiltonian that is dipole time field operator. And so this is a purely unitary Hamiltonian dynamics. But then what you do is you integrate out the field. So how do you integrate out the field? Uh, there are different ways of doing that, but the way that we follow is using the Green's function. And this is, we do it like this because it is very general. So you can do it for any, you know, once you have solved for the Green's function, which is an electromagnetic problem type of, then you don't have to, then you can, once you have solved for it, then you can plug it in these equations. And so this is generic. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm gonna solve this problem for a cavity. I'm going to solve the problem of the quantum dynamics for a free space. No, it's generic. You just plug the, the Green's function of each of these reservoirs there. And why it is uh, the imaginary part and the real part is because, uh, so first they are related by a fluctuation dissipation theorem. And this arises from the fact that you are integrating out these photonic degrees of freedom. So now you have a bath. So the, the fact that now you are in contact with a bath means that now you have this dissipative term in the, in the dynamics. And this dissipation is related with the imaginary part of the Green's function. So in particular, if you look at, uh, you could do this procedure for a single atom in free space. And there the Green's function is the vacuum Green's function. And then the, on, for a single atom, you have the same index. This is the local part of the imaginary part of the Green's function. And you can relate this exactly with the spontaneous emission rate. So for an atom, this procedure gives you that if you're in the excited state, it will decay, the atom will decay at a rate that is given by the spontaneous emission rate in back. Yes. Okay. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, it, it said that it seemed that you need the bat to explain that you have an imaginary part and then you, uh, you have an imaginary part, then you have a bat. I mean, it's, uh, when you say you integrate out the, uh, the electromagnetic degree of freedom, yes. that's, that was part of your bat right? that you started Yeah, with? so the electromagnetic degrees of freedom, once they are integrated out, they behave as a bat. And when you do this procedure of integration, you're going to have resonant terms and what are called resonant terms and non-resonant terms. Non-resonant terms give rise to the real part of the Green's function and resonant terms give rise to the imaginary part of the Green's function. So you have integral over frequency of the uh, Green's function divided by one over omega minus omega zero. And so you have like a delta term that gives you the imaginary part yeah. and uh, another part, that, a principal value part that gives you the, the real part. Okay. And so. you say you don't need to be specific about the way the, this, these electromagnetic waves are confined. So you don't, you don't you let them 
be free space or you can't yeah, so them? yes so the issue is that if you read uh, i think uh, mostly old papers they were trying to do this problem of i have a bunch of atoms in a cavity so in a cavity i have the film i know what are how to describe the field uh, modes of the cavity and then i integrate them out and then i get to the dynamics of the atoms then i do it for free space so i write down the field uh, modes and i integrate them out and so on and so forth but then you have to go through all this kind of annoying calculation where in reality what you're doing when you integrate out these field modes all the complexity of the of the field modes you you hide it into the greens function right. and so the greens function is related with you know i mean it, it has a tensorial structure you can build it from these field eigen modes and so all the nastiness of how this looks like you put it there and so you can solve uh, you can solve the electromagnetic problem separate from the atomic problem. But in general, I have to say that finding the Green's function is typically hard. So again, it's like uh, it's so the Green's function is the uh, fundamental solution of the wave equation. So you know you have to solve that, and usually you require symmetries in your problem. So vacuum is easy, or maybe a fiber with circular section, or maybe a half space. Mm -hmm. But it usually involves like integrals in uh, the complex plane, and this is like the easy ones. So in general, it's complicated. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Lily has a question too. So just a quick one. I was wondering if you could give us some physical intuition for what these off-diagonal decay terms uh, involve. Yes. So so the local part, so the non-diagonal, will be just the kind of single atom decay rate. That's the imaginary part, and actually the real part is related with a lamp shift. Uh, so it depends if you put the atom close to a mirror, then this J will change and it will produce a shift in the energy. The non-local term is just coupling, so it's related with the uh, one given atom uh, decaying, emitting a photon, and this other, this other atom picks it up. Or if you want to think from another perspective, it's just that a given atom feels all the others as if you're changing the the electric environment of the atoms so now instead of having an atom and a mirror you can think of i have an atom and this piece of the electric is now if you want a mirror so it has to change something in the atom here okay okay so these these aren't correlated decay processes where you have multiple atoms decaying simultaneously it's it's more changes in the decay process mediated by the state of other atoms i mean but this eventually is the same so if when you start um when so you can picture at least when you have just one excitation as all the atoms behaving as some sort of dielectric for a given one that you care about and this is going to change the properties of these atoms or you can think of it as you know, now these are dipoles that are correlated because when they are excited and they decay, they emit a photon that is going to pick, be picked by another. And so I can have processes where I put like an excitation shared among all of them. And these are, is a dark state or a super radiant state, or I could have, I could flip all of them. And I'm going to have a process that is uh, analogous to Dicky super radiant. So they are all going to decay and they are going to see each other. While they see each other, they synchronize and so on and so forth. So it's just coupling between different spins, if you want. Mm -hmm. Does okay. that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I should maybe move on. Or yes. Maybe, okay. Okay, so now then let's be specific. Let's look at a simple case that is one bit chain in free space and just one excitation. So in general, I can have as many excitations as I have atoms but I'm going to deal with the most simple case that is just one excitation. So when I do that, I can describe the dynamics instead of in terms of this uh, density matrix that is complicated, I'm still going to evolve a pure state, but with a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, where I, can, I have plugged both the real and the imaginary part of the Green's function. And then there will be processes of photon emission, but when I have one excitation, uh, photon emission is kind of boring because it leads me to the ground state and the dynamics end. So then I can neglect them. They are going to be very important when I talk about what happens when I have multiple excitations. Okay, so now if I said that, okay, we are in one, exc one excitation subspace, the Hamiltonian actually conserves the number of excitations. The part that uh, uh, doesn't is the Lindblad operator 
or the jump operators as I will describe in a couple of minutes or in 10 minutes. Uh, and then I'm going to deal with this problem in free space. So this is the Green's function in free space. So this is a textbook Green's function, easy to find. So as I said before, it's like a sum of, it, the field decays as a sum of power laps. So given that I have this Hamiltonian, I can diagonalize it, thinking that this is an infinite chain. So I'm going to have, of course, the eigenstates are going to be block waves. And so they are going to look like this. So they are going to have an associated wave vector and only one atom, atom J, is going to be excited. So it's a superposition of a given atom excited and all the others in the ground state, and this excitation has a given wave vector. And so when I diagonalize my Hamiltonian using this basis, I'm going to find the dispersion relation, which is the frequency or the energy of these spin excitations, and I'm going to have the decay rate also of these spin waves, because this is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. It means that some of the spin waves are going to have a finite lifetime. So when I do that, this is what I find. So this is the first Brillouin zone. This is the dispersion relation, this line blue. And I have um, separated my Brillouin zone in two pieces. So this gray area is what I call the non-guided region. So everything here is radiative. It's going to have a finite lifetime. After a certain amount of time, if I prepare a spin excitation with these wave vectors, it's going to decay. Why is this? Because it has a wave vector that is compatible with a photon that propagates in free space. As soon as I cross what is called the light line, I'm going to have um, spin excitations with a wave vector along C that is larger than the, the, the maximum wave vector that a photon can have in free space. Because for a given frequency, uh, the wave vector of a photon is, uh, you know, they are related by the speed of light, so they cannot be arbitrarily high. So this basically means that if this is longer than this one, the perpendicular wave vector has to be imaginary to compensate, which means that now these spin excitations are confined along the chain. They can propagate, but in this direction, they are evanescent, which is precisely a guided mode. And this is precisely because they, it's, a, you know, it's a dark state, just because of energy momentum mismatch. It's very basic physics, actually. And so this only happens uh, in one div below a critical distance that is lambda over two. And uh, the critical distance depends on the dimensionality of the lattice. Okay. So now, if you believe me that there are dark states, it means that we can use this as a waveguide because now I can prepare a spin excitation, it will propagate without the scattering. So to compare, if we have an optically dense medium, a bunch of atoms disorder and so on, when we send light in the system, it is going to be radiated away. Here, because of interference and because of order, we are going to have like a transparency window. So now light is going to be able to propagate without the scattering in this uh, medium. So now uh, this means that we can use these atomic arrays as uh, waveguides, as a bath for an impurity qubit that we can place in the atomic waveguide. So as I've said before, for cell tolerance, the decay rate of an emitter depends on the environment. And now we're going to think about these chains as an environment. So we can integrate them out. Now, before we integrated out the photonic degrees of freedom, now we're going to integrate out these atomic degrees of freedom of this chain. And it means now that not only we're going to have a decay rate for this qubit to decay into this guided mode, so now it's going to produce a spin wave that propagates away from the qubit, it also means that these atomic waveguides can mediate interactions between different impurity qubits located far away from each other. So um, technically you do that by building a Green's function for this system. So in general, as I said, finding a Green's function is hard. In this case, because of cylindrical symmetry and considering an infinite chain, it is possible to find the Green's function. And it involves basically the vacuum Green's function plus the Green's function of the chain. And as you can imagine, this Green's function is related with an integral over Brillouin zone of some part that is a spatial part and a dispersion relation. And so this tells you that when omega, whatever frequency, crosses the dispersion relation of the of the of the of this waveguide, now we're going to have a pole. So it means that we're going to have emission into this guided mode. So from a formal perspective, doing things in 1D is beautiful because you just go to the complex plane and you get what is a pole is a guided mode and what is not a pole is just radiation. And so we can calculate this formally and if you are interested in the details, I can give them later. 
Uh, but the important thing is that we have now the impurity qubit decays at a rate that is inversely proportional to the group velocity. So if you think of the group velocity, it tells you how fast the photon propagates or this spin wave propagates in this waveguide. And if it propagates very slowly, now this spin wave interacts a lot with this uh, impurity qubit. So it makes sense that the group velocity appears in this decay rate. And now we have also a decay rate into free space that is modified because of the presence of the chain. And so the interesting part now is that it depends on whether the impurity qubit has a frequency that crosses the band or if it has a frequency that is above the band. And so if it crosses the band, then this propagation of guided modes is allowed. And if it's not uh, in the band, it means that these, these spin excitations can have always to remain close to the impurity qubit. They cannot propagate anymore. And so I just wanted to tell you that, and I can provide more details later if you're interested in any of this part, that indeed you can do anything that you can do in waveguide QED, you can do with this idea of atomic waveguide QED. You can have a large optical depth, so a strong interaction between, or efficient interaction between the spin wave that propagates in the chain and the impurity qubit. Uh, so the optical depth is, you know, of the order of 10 for certain like semi-reasonable numbers. You can have an impurity qubit uh, reflect almost perfectly one of these uh, spin excitations. And if you put many of them, they behave a, as an even a stronger mirror. You have also coherent spin exchange. So if now the impurity qubit frequency is above the band gap, there is no, you are, have switch off dissipation. Things cannot propagate along the waveguide. And it means that you can have a coherent population exchange between the two impurity qubits. And this decay rate happens because you can still, even though you don't decay into the waveguide, you decay still outside into free space. And you can do also chiral quantum optics because this is a 1D chain of atoms. So this means that it has a near field and this near field has helicity. And then if you put a qubit impurity with the right polarization, it will emit only in one direction and not the other. So these are different paradigms of uh, you know, waveguide QD and we can do the calculations now because of this technique with the Green's function, both analytically and numerically, and you know, with a actual evolution, numerical evolution of the system, and both give the same result. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that we are not the only ones thinking along those lines. So there are, in this year, two recent uh, papers have appeared. One extends this idea to, to the arrays, uh, and the other is uh, using a ring of atoms uh, to behave as a cavity for an impurity qubit. And so everything I have told you right now, you could say, okay, this person has been saying atom and quantum optics and all this, but in reality, all of this is classical. And this is classical because it's a single excitation. So there is no notion of saturation or the two level la nature of atoms do not come into play when you just have one excitation. So what happens when you have more? And this is what I'm going to talk to you about in what remains of my talk. So we can first think of what happens when you have two because it's the simplest. Um, so let's imagine that we have an optical system of fiber and we send two photons and they cross. So what happens? As far as I know, and I hope you also know, nothing happens. So if uh, you know it's a linear medium, they should cross as if the other guy doesn't exist at all. Um, so this means that photons do not interact with each other in a linear, you know, classical medium. So what people have done to make them interact, to realize photon-photon interactions, is to place them, you know, propagate them in an optically dense medium, so a cloud of atoms that is, you know, dense to optically dense to photons. You create a transparency window using electromagnetically induced transparency. This is just a channel uh, created by interference so that photons can propagate. And then you couple a control field, so some external laser, to some Rydberg level. So now when these two photons that are propagating in this transparency window touch, this Rydberg level basically produces a very large shift of energy in the atom around it. So it means that now this other photon cannot, basically either cannot propagate and it's dissipated into the environment or it picks up a phase. So this is how people do quantum nonlinear optics. Usually it involves electromagnetically induced transparency and Rydberg atoms. So 
my claim is that in this order system, we don't need Reaper. We just need, I mean, we are going to bank on the hardcore nature of two level systems. And so the, what I'm going to show you in the next slide is what happens when two spin excitations cross. So basically two things can happen. One is that they cross and they are ejected from the chain. So this is a dissipative collision or they can cross and they can pick up a phase like soliton. So without distortion. So this is a coherent uh, interaction. And so depending on the distance between the, the atoms, uh, what you're seeing here is the population of the chain for two different distances as a function of time in arbitrary units. So this is where the collision happens. And you see that after collision for a small lattice constant, the population remains the same. And the, for a large lattice constant, the population has decreased significantly. So you can tailor how dissipative this collision is by changing the lattice constant. And then the interesting thing is what happens when the collision is not dissipative, is coherent. What happens is that then you can pick up a phase. And this phase actually in the limit of very small lattice constant, it approaches pi. So now you can think of uh, doing this kind of procedure of crossing photons, colliding photons with each other to realize conditioned phase gates for photons. So you could think of computing, doing a quantum computer actually using this protocol. So this is something that we are exploring now. So we have the numerical results for this. So we are trying to come up with a kind of toy model to explain this process. Okay. So now in what remains of my talk, I want to talk about what happens when you start piling up more and more photons in this system and the physics becomes very, very different because you lose completely the idea of waveguide, of dark states, this is all gone and everything you have is a lot of radiation, okay? So let's try to understand this. So basically when you have many photons packed, packed together, radiation is unavoidable. And this is because this idea of oh, we have like these extended excitations that I can characterize with a wave vector. This is not possible anymore because these are it's a very local excitation. All of them are excited. So they, there is no room for any type of a spin wave. And so now if we have all the atoms in the excited state, this is the most extreme case. I have as many photons or as many excitations as atoms. What is going to happen in this situation? So this is a problem that in 1953, Dickey addressed. So he was concerned about what happens when you put many emitters close to each other. So we know that if they are very, very far away from each other because the field decays in free space, they should not talk to each other. So when they, emit photons, they do it at a rate that decays exponentially in time. So it's kind of boring. Each of them is decaying as it, at its own rate. But if they, they are very close to each other or what is equal in a cavity, what happens is that as they start decaying, they start synchronizing and they start building a dipole moment. And eventually, you, uh, this synchronization leads to a radiation burst that happens not at the beginning of the dynamics, but at a time that is after. Okay, so this is an example of synchronization, quantum synchronization. So the question is what happens now for extended chains? So we know that far away, the physics is boring. Close is the physics of Dickey super radiance. So what happens if now you have a mesoscopic uh, or semi-extended system? And the answer is not clear, so people have been discussing about this for decades uh, and blaming the loss of super radiance in different terms of you know the dynamics and what is going on so this is our take on on the matter okay so now i'm going to think about this uh, how to describe this theoretically in a different way from before so i have this density matrix that again has a hamiltonian part so in the case case this does not contribute but it will contribute in our case and now we have this Lindblad operator and before it was written in terms of single atom operators, so sigma EGs, so kind of flip operators. And now I have diagonalized it and I, I'm writing it in terms of collective jump operators. So these collective jump operators, they act on all the atoms at the same time. And they act at a rate that are, is related with the decay rate of the jump operator that you obtain by diagonalizing the imaginary part of the Green's function written as a matrix. So you have, for instance, eight atoms, you will have an eight by eight matrix. 
and the coefficients will be the imaginary part of the Green's function between atom one and atom one, atom one and atom two, and so on. You build your matrix, you diagonalize it, and you have, I mean, it's like, I don't know, for phonons, normal modes. Like these are the normal modes of this dissipation. And they are associated with photon emission. So whenever a jump operator acts on my chain, this means a photon is going to be released because I lower the number of excitations. And so whenever a jump operator acts, because it's a collective operator, it's going to imprint a set of faces on my atoms. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow these dynamics instead of solving this, oh, sorry, instead of solving this density matrix, we're going to follow it in terms of evolving a quantum, uh, a pure state, so a wave function. And we are going to apply these quantum jumps stochastically, randomly. So this is the, what is called uh, the stochastic wave function approach. So this is if somebody technically cares about how we do this, then this is the answer. Okay, so then maybe for the sake of time, well, no, I can talk about this. So we can calculate these decay rates as a function of the distance. For 10 atoms, I'm going to have as many decay rates as atoms. So I'm going to have 10 decay rates. And you see that there are, you know, these decay rates changes significantly with the distance. So again, if the atoms are very far away from each other, they all, they all uh, converge to the single atom spontaneous emission rate in vacuum. And below this critical distance in 1D, you have very bright jump operators and very dark jump operators. So these are actually subradiant states. So this is what I was banking on in the beginning of my talk. And I can also calculate, I said that when a jump operator acts, it, it, this produces the emission of a photon. And this emission of a photon is directional. So certain jump operators will produce a peak in, so if this is theta is the angle of emission, it will produce a peak in this direction or it will produce a photon emission in this direction or in that direction, it depends. And you can calculate this uh, analytically. And the solutions where these peaks happen is exactly, you find the same expression as in classical phase rates. So if any of you is an electrical engineer and care about the physics of antennas, for instance, this is just physics of classical antennas. So I wonder actually about what, you know, this physics of, of arrays, of phase arrays has been going on for a long time. So the first uh, historic, I don't know, piece of uh, research or science that I found related with this kind of, you have a bunch of dipoles emitting coherently, is this mammoth radar. So this was built in 1944. This was for radio waves, I think. And so uh, this was used to detect planes that were going to attack Germans. So if you make these phase arrays smaller, people now regularly put, at least research-wise, they put these chips on top of cars. You, uh, you can do LiDAR, you can, it's like a way for the car to see, basically. So you can control the car and how it moves. Uh, and then if you minimize these uh, antennas even further, you get to atoms. I guess it's probably the tiniest possible antenna that you can have. And this is all true, this is all true if you just have one excitation. But when you start piling up excitations, the quantumness of the atoms start to be important. And so this is what we're going to discuss now. So going back to what happens when you have many excitations, this is the normalized photon emission rate as a function of time. And so I said that in the Dickey case where all the atoms are at the same point, they all talk to each other with the same rate. So it's a very symmetric, symmetrical problem. And what happens is that you have this peak and then it decays. As you start now separating your atoms, creating a lattice, what happens is that this uh, bump starts decreasing and eventually it completely decays. And so why is this a hard problem? This is a hard problem because the Hilbert space scales us two to the end. So 10 by 10 array, so 100 atoms, this is, this is enormous. So nobody can really calculate this exactly. So what we thought about is to try to understand this physics from the perspective of the uh, jump operators. So in the case of uh, Dickey, when all the atoms are exactly at the same point, there is only one jump operator. All the others have zero rate of action, which means that if I start with all my atoms in the excited state and uh, after the dynamics, they go to the ground state. Uh, and I depict here the action of jump operators, which is the action where whenever one of these circles act, 
one photon is emitted and one exci the excitation number is lowered by one. And I classify them from the most radiant, so the ones that have the highest rate of action to the least radiant. So remember that this is a stochastic process. Uh, there is only one, so there is just one channel of decay, so it's very boring. And that's why you can solve it exactly. And there is no competition between jump operators. However, when you start to separate the atoms, uh, this is no longer true. You have a lot of jump operators that want to act in your system. And this competition, as I said, every jump operator produces a set of phases in the atoms. Then the imprint of these phases randomizes the atoms and it leads to decoherence. So this produces that the synchronization is not going to be as strong anymore. And then you can continue and you can make your lattice larger and larger. And then the number of dark states is very minimal. So all of them want to act. And then you completely uh, have forgot, like you have completely washed out the coherence of your atoms. And this is how super radiance dies. It's actually because of dissipation. It's not because of the coherent evolution of the system. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is that actually this process is a process of stimulate sorry, spontaneous emission. So uh, the atoms start decaying spontaneously, but the, when they decay, decay, there are correlations that are built up by the action of the jump operators. So what happens actually is that the jump operators enhance their own action. So whenever one in, starts acting, the next one, it is going to be more likely that it's exactly the same jump operator. The same phase is going to be imprinted on the atoms. But again, because it's a stochastic, you know, you have this fight. So some other may act, and this is going to deface your array. And so the interesting thing is that we realize that this synchronization happens, you know, either it happens in the beginning or, you know, you die and super radiance dies completely. So we can truncate the dynamics to the early part, and we can predict for which distance we're going to have this crossover between super radiance and just regular decay. And we do that uh, numerically, but now we have found an analytical formula also to predict this. And we see that there is a transition or a crossover between burst and no, no burst that depends on the geometry and the polarization of the atoms. And for a 1D chain, it happens at 0 0.25, more or less. OK, so I think with this, I'm done with all the many body physics as well. And I just wanted to mention why I think uh, this physics is interesting. First is, you know, very basic physics is just dipoles interacting with light. It just happens that when you write it in a, you know, quantum formalism, this is an open quantum system with long range interactions. So things are hard to solve. You can have many degrees of freedom that are competing with each other and interesting physics can happen in that way. And what we want to do now in the future is to study higher dimensions. So if you have lattices instead of 1D, you go to 2D or 3D you can engineer richer dispersion relations. You can also um, control how photons propagate in this medium. So in a regular dielectrics, this is very hard to do, but one can imagine that by using dressing fields with these atom arrays, you can um, change the dispersion relation in time, such that as a photon propagates, you can change the group velocity, such that now it wants to go in the other direction. And then you change it again, and then it wants to go in the other direction. And this is a way of basically trapping photons. Uh, we want to explore or more carefully study the realization of photon uh, gates using photon-photon interactions. And we are also excited to understand super radiance in other dimensions. So what's the role of geometry and topology for kind of this uh, uh, complicated dynamical uh, behavior? And we would like to see what is whether we can do feedback on the system. So again, we have a system where photon emission is stochastic, controlling the dynamics is very complicated, but, but maybe by using measurement, so detection of photons, um, we can at least try to control the dynamics such that we can maybe address a target state. And so with this, I just wanted to um, acknowledge everyone involved in this work, in particular my postdoc, Stuart, who has done, you know, all the work that I showed you here today. And if you're interested in the first part of the talk, the uh, Atomic Wave Guide QED, you can look at that paper. And if you're interested in the many body part, uh, it's um, in this other manuscript. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Anna, for the nice talk. Um, 
so the floor is open for questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hand if you have uh, if you have a question. Uh, Kartik. Uh, hi. Yeah. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Uh, so I had a question. Can you actually engineer um, non-lossy photon-photon gates? I mean, or do you always get some lost? Um, yeah. So I can answer this. Yeah. So this is the so this is for a given uh, you know for given parameters in my system. So I'm initializing some spin wave with a given wave vector. So I can tell you what the, the why the loss arises. Uh, the loss arises because uh, this is a scattering problem. So if you go, so if you let me show you exactly this one. So it's a scattering problem. So you can think of it in terms of this brilliant zone. So I initialize uh, a spin wave with this wave vector and then another with the negative one, no? so that they cross. And when they cross, they are going to get deformed. And they get deformed because you cannot put two photons in the same atom. So this is going to produce certain deformation, which in K space produces a certain population in along the bridge and sound, right? And so in particular, some population will fall inside this gray area that is the light cone. And anything that falls inside is going to produce dissipation. Mm -hmm. And so why the distance matter? Um, the light cone is kind of fixed in this picture, but when you make the distance very, very, uh, very, very small, the brilliant zone becomes really big. So then the, the uh, area of the dissipative part of the brilliant zone, if you want, compared to the whole area of the brilliant zone decreases. So that's why a small distance leads to le less loss. And large distance, at least, but even below the critical distance, leads to more loss. So the answer is, and also, of course, if you if you start around here, it's better than if you start very close to the light line, because again, the population uh, is mostly this scattering is uh, um, happens into adjacent modes. So you want to be as far away from the light cone as possible. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is that my honest answer is that I think only in the limit of D going to zero, you can do lossless uh, physics. Mm -hmm. uh, you are going to approach lossless, but I think it is definitely, I mean, at least like this, there is always going to be certain amount of loss. But I think the interesting part is that this thing happens. So people suggested the realization of uh, condition phase gates using a single emitter in a wave guy. But the problem there is that because the interaction is very local, it just happens in this, uh, basically in this single atom, then this produces a lot of deformation of the of the photons. So the fidelity of your gate is really terrible. Here, because the interaction is non-local, so it happens over an extended region, you overcome this, uh, this issue. So this was a very big issue uh, for doing conditioned phase gates. So this doesn't apply, but still there is certain amount of loss. Yes. So, so you can't make the whole wave packet smooth enough that somehow the deformation is weak enough that you don't you know, go into this forbidden region. It, you always, you say, you always have some dissipation. I think you always will have some dissipation. Yes. Right. And, and but it still is not. But it's still, the, the issue is that because it's over an extended region. I mean, dissipation is one problem, which it limits your fidelity. But the other problem is that it is this distortion, and the distortion you can. Uh, because it's not, uh, again, it's not, uh, the pulses are not interacting just in one point. The distortion is not so significant. So that part you are free from in you know, this extended medium. Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I'll also ask a question. Uh, so you talked in the first part of the talk about the atomic waveguides, and at some point you compare with ordinary waveguides. And I was wondering, is there anything, any phenomenon that happens for atomic waveguides that doesn't take place for the ordinary ones or? Yeah, so in particular, if you want to compare it one-on-one, -on -one, it would be, there is this uh, people in silicon photonics, they have this um, sub-wavelength grating waveguide. So they pick this, they take these silicon pieces and place them periodically. And so this would be exactly, the physics is exactly the same. So a regular waveguide guides because of internal, I'm really bad at these things, internal, uh, reflection, refraction. So basically there is an angle over which the light cannot escape. 
Uh, right. This is different if they operate because of subradiance or darkness, if you want, is interference. So it's not just different refractive index. So that's different. But in silicon, people can do this some wavelength grading waveguides, and the physics there is exactly the same as the physics here. There is, as far as I know, at the single excitation level, there is nothing that a waveguide can do that an atomic waveguide cannot do, and vice versa. But the only thing that I think is and then, of course, when you put more in, intera more excitations, the physics is very different. But if you ask me, well, why would I go through the process of, you know, building a dielectric like this? I would say that you have two advantages, at least from a theoretical standpoint, is that first you have a single atom control. So you could imagine now I'm going to flip a given atom and this is like a switch. So now I'm going to reflect or not. So this is very hard to do with a dielectric. And right. the second thing is that... Uh, by using external dressing fields that um, act on all atoms collectively, you can change the uh, properties of these waveguides in time. And this is very hard also to do with a regular dielectric. To do this fast is very hard, and you can do this with atomic waveguides. Okay. Okay, and then maybe a more slightly more technical question. You showed this uh, after integrating out the, the photons. You showed uh, an effective uh, Hamiltonian for the atoms, atomic chain, yeah. and yeah. it only involved a sigma x sigma x coupling. And I was wondering, is it possible to to have some sigma z sigma z kind of coupling? Uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, you will have so for instance here. Yes, yeah, yeah. so if you go to higher order in perturbation theory, you will have a sigma EE, -E, sigma EE. -E. So it's like a Rydberg type or sigma C uh, interaction. Yeah. So this is precisely what a Rydberg uh, interaction for, I was wondering if, for example, if you had like, there you assume that all the atoms had the same resonance frequency uh, in the, yeah. the chain. But if you had, for example, like two types of atoms uh, 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 forming a lattice, uh, like two atoms per unit cell, sort of with different frequency, with different resonance frequencies. Would that maybe give to, I don't know if that would be anything useful, but is that something that uh, people have explored? So, I mean, the answer I would say is, I don't think people have explored very much this, but, uh, uh, but uh, so it wouldn't change, of course, the structure of the Hamiltonian, like you're not going to uh, have a sigma C, sigma C term, but what would happen is, uh, like just speaking, I could think on this as, like some sort of like, I don't know, like a Peyer's instability or like a SSH model. So you have now coupling between this and this and this and this. So then you will have the physics of, I mean, it's not exactly the SSH model because in this case you have long range, long range interactions, but then yes, you will have like some defect uh, uh, edge modes and so on, yes. So you could imagine like trying to come with concepts that appear in condensed matter physics regularly and try to apply them in in these arrays, but people have not yet done that. I expect 2021 to be that year, <laughs> probably. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, any other uh, questions from the audience? I don't, uh, ah, Michel, Michel? Yes, um, give you one question. Uh, thank you for the interesting subject. I didn't know much about it, so I've learned a lot. Um, you did mention at the beginning that you were taking uh, idealized atoms, make of two levels. Yes. Did you look into uh, how robust are uh, your resolve if you include some reality and some noise into this atom? Yes, so that's a very good question. So there are different ways, give me one sec. There are different ways where all this can blow up. <laughs> so I can explain some of them. Yeah. So the first one is you can start considering the fact that atoms are not, not really two-level atoms, but they are actually, they typically involve like transitions that have some angular, so some, some uh, angular momentum. So uh, this has uh, extreme consequences. So depending on the geometry, you can make the scattering. So if you have a, what is called a cycling transition, so from ground to excited state and is for um, states within the atomic structure that have a maximum projection of angular momentum along the quantization axis. This is a closed transition. It's very different from this one that can decay both into this state or that state. So if you are looking at closed transitions and you use a 1D geometry, you're scattering how photons that are re-emitted are emitted from here impinge another atom, is going to preserve the polarization. This is not true if you have, for instance, a 2D array. Uh, in certain directions, the, the polarization is going to change. 
So then this is going to now completely break down the two level picture and you're going to have the hyperfine structure is going to completely mess up with you. So we looked at uh, what happens when you have hyperfine structure and the problem is very complicated because already at the single excitation manifold, it's a many body problem. So you have a completely de degenerate ground state. Uh, we found dark states there, but we don't even know. We know that they are dark. We don't even know how to prepare them. So the first answer to your question is, Hyperfine structure is very complicated. If you are an experimentalist, I would deal with a transition that goes from J equals zero, so you have just one ground state, to J equals one. Multiple excited states doesn't matter. It's the multiple ground states what kill you. So this is the first thing. Uh, in 1D, again, with a magnetic field, you're, you're fine for, one, for a 1D array, so that's okay. Then the second thing that can kill you is disorder. So disorder come in different uh, ways, so you can have uh, so again, you have, you're trapping your atom with an optical twister. So it means that now you have some kind of uh, atomic wave function spreading. So this doesn't seem to be um, very damaging because you can always confine your, like make your twister more confined. Um, then there is like, there is a certain, you know, they might not all be at the, exactly the same position. Uh, this is one, le one way where you can have disorder, and the other is filling fractions. So you may have some twisters that are not filled. Mm -hmm. This I'm, Again, I'm talking, so this physics is kind of very universal, so it would apply to solid state uh, materials and then, sorry, solid state defects, and then the, the disorder there is like in frequencies. It's not in so much in whether you have a defect or not, for instance. Um, so disorder is very damaging in 1D. So for the wave guiding properties, uh, it will be damaging in two ways. One is that if you have a, an atom that is kind of out of sight, it's going to produce a scattering into free space. And so this is bad, but the worst part is uh, actually that it can produce reflection. Mm -hmm. So you can have a process that is like Anderson localization. It's not exactly Anderson localization because you still have all free space. So it's like a 1D in 3D. So it's not, it doesn't follow the scalings of Anderson localization. But effectively is that you have so many backscattering and so on, so many reflections that it produces localization. And then eventually your excitation is going to decay because it's trapped there and it cannot move. Uh, so the issue is if you add disorder, if you are in a region where the group velocity is not super slow, you are still okay because it's the same as in, a, in optics. If you have a fiber and you have group velocity that is not completely slow, Disorder is not going to kill you. It's just going to add some, you know, absorption per unit length. But if you, which in, I mean, in quantum mechanics, it means that at some point you will lose your photon and it's not great, but you know, you can reduce that. But if the group velocity is very slow, this localization can kill you. And if the group velocity is, is slow, it's precisely where the coupling of the impurity qubit is very large. So very large coupling will lead will be very non-robust against disorder. And this is the same problem that people have in photonic crystals. Like photonic crystals, if you want to be in the region where the group velocity is very slow, disorder eventually is gonna kill you. So then these are the, the trade-offs. So of course I cannot say, I can say that subradiance and darkness and so on, is not just a single point in the parameter space. So you don't have to have a perfect lattice to have it. But mm -hmm. I can tell you that in 1D in particular for the wave, wave guiding properties is going to affect the physics. For multiple excitations, it's not so damaging actually because it's like, again, like you see 3D. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, I don't see any more raised hands. So uh, uh, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll thank everybody for coming to this talk. Uh, thank you also, Anna, for the nice talk. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I, I will see each other all uh, ne next week, next Thursday. Yeah.